This is Grand Central Terminal, fall 1927. This is America in the Jazz Age. Human events that will have ossified into history by 2022 are the everyday here. Babe Ruth and the Yanks are World Series champs. Charles Lindbergh conquered the Atlantic by air. In South Dakota, 400 men and women are chipping away at Mount Rushmore, removing everything that doesn't look like four presidents. And over at the Roxy, you could lay down four bits to see and hear Al Jolson in The Jazz Singer. Amid this hubbub, you can be forgiven for not noticing a pivotal moment in the story of humans and canines. You'll find it across the street in that newsstand. Hey, I'm talking here. I'm talking here. Uh, yeah, yeah, here we are. In the November 5th edition of the Saturday Evening Post, an article called The Seeing Eye by Dorothy Harrison Hustis, a 4,000-word primer on a concept that few Americans seem to have heard of, training dogs to guide the blind and visually impaired. It was this article that would catch the attention of just enough key players to set a chain of events in motion, leading to large-scale training and the normalization of guide dogs in American life. That's the power of a good magazine. Whoa, hey pal, that's a nickel. You take debit? I'm gonna guess no. There have been dogs as long as there have been people. Cookies! This dog was going places, fast. The American Kennel Club. Kennel Club. Take your dog down and back for me, please. Down and Back. Stories from the AKC Archives. This is the show for you. With Bud Bacone. This puppy has potential. Here we are again, Grand Central Terminal today. 95 years have passed, and everything has changed. Excuse me, buddy. I still think you owe me a nickel. Almost everything has changed. Today there are 2,100 guide dog teams, that's a dog and a human, across North America. More than 22,000 teams worldwide. Guide dog teams have long since taken their place on city streets and restaurants and train stations, stores and workplaces. In 2021, International Guide Dog Federation member organizations produced more than 7,200 puppies, most of them Labrador Retrievers, but also including Golden Retrievers, German Shepherd Dogs, Standard Poodles, and Labrador and Golden Crosses. More on the guide dog breeds a little later. Yet for all the hype in 1927, the story of guide dogs began long, long before then. Did you notice there's a guide dog mentioned in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol all the way back in 1843? Uh, here, on page 7. Dickens wrote of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. Three decades later, in 1878, the British Parliament passed a dog licensing bill. It included exemptions for, and we quote, shepherd's dogs and those kept by the blind as guides. Go almost anywhere, any time in recorded history, and guide dogs, though never ubiquitous, were a presence. There is a painted scroll, several yards long, painted in 13th century China, showing a busy street. Within the crowd is a blind man being navigated by a dog on a taut leash. In his other hand, he holds a long staff. There's a copy of the scroll in New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. In the 1660s, within a decade of that scroll being painted, an Irish monk named Bartholomew was writing about the lot of the visually impaired in his part of the world. Here, he speaks to the complex ancient bond between canines and humans, and in case your Latin's a little rusty, I'll translate. 
The unfortunate conditions of a blind man are so great that it makes him not only subject to being led by a child or by a servant, but also by a dog. In fact, the blind man is often brought to such a circumstance that, in order to pass over and escape the perils of a bridge or a ford, he is compelled to trust to a dog more than to himself. Also, in many perilous situations where men might doubt or dread to go, the blind man, because he sees no danger, is a sure guide. Turns out there's evidence in writing, folklore, and art of dogs guiding blind people, spanning the centuries from unrelated cultures all around the planet. How far back does the evidence go? At least as far back as ancient Herculaneum, a thriving port town on the Gulf of Naples, conveniently close to major trade routes and inconveniently close to Mount Vesuvius. Like its inland neighbor Pompeii, Herculaneum was buried in ash in 79 AD. And buried, it would remain at least until the 1700s when its secrets and treasures were uncovered. Among them was one particular mural depicting a man presumably blind at a Herculaneum market, begging alms from two women. Ahead of him, at the end of a short leash, is a dog who appears to be leading him. Ancient Romebus, Guide Dogabus. It's a 2,000-year-old reference to guide dogs, and for the moment, the earliest known. While it's unlikely that these early guide dogs were purpose-bred, it's interesting that the one in this mural, like the one painted on the Chinese scroll 12 centuries later, were relatively small dogs, smaller than the labs and German shepherd dogs in service today. And given that alms don't grow on trees, it's just as well that smaller dogs require less food. While the use of guide dogs goes back at least two millennia, the science of training guide dogs is a much more recent story. In 1780, Le Cans Hospital for the Blind in Paris introduced a system of training dogs to aid blind people, but any gains were soon halted by that uh, pesky French Revolution. For the next century, others throughout Europe worked on systems for training guide dogs, yet none found traction. A cause of the slow growth was that relatively few people had need of a guide dog. World War I would take care of that. Through four bloody years, the colossal might of modern ingenuity, energy, and wealth was focused on instruments of war. Among its innovations, poison gas. It was horrific and indiscriminate. The slightest shift in the breeze could turn it against the side that deployed it. The gas caused severe burns to the skin, the lungs, and the eyes, aiding those combatants and also facing those risks were dogs. To the Allies, many were mercy dogs. To the Germans, they were sanitations, or medical dogs. Fearlessly, they would patrol no man's land, often at night or after a battle. Some served as messengers, others carried saddlebags filled with medical supplies for the wounded. For the badly wounded, they were trained to bring a piece of clothing back to the line. Using the scent from that cloth, they could then guide medics back to the wounded soldier. These heroic dogs included boxers, German shepherd dogs, Doberman pinchers, collies, pointers, and setters. Their heroics and their sacrifice were well recorded. By one estimate, 10,000 mercy dogs served in World War I and are credited with saving thousands of lives. Of these dogs, thousands would be killed or wounded, many scarred with PTSD or shell shock in the parlance of the day. After its defeat, Germany faced a new strain, demobilized soldiers, especially the wounded. Many of Germany's 2.7 million disabled or chronically ill young men dotted the sidewalks of its cities and villages. Tens of thousands of them were young men rendered blind by poison gas, but with no other physical injuries. 
Their paltry soldiers' pension couldn't sustain them, so many turned to selling pencils on the street or simply begging. Driven by either compassion or by economic necessity, Germany turned to canines as a means of restoring these young men to the workforce. The human the Germans turned to for help was one Dr. Gerhard Stalling. In 1916, with the war in its second year, Stalling had opened a guide dog school for the blind in Oldenburg, Germany. There are variations to the story, but... A popular version is that Dr. Stalling was inspired by something that happened in the hospital where he was treating a blind soldier. When the doctor was suddenly called away, he left his German shepherd dog with the patient. When he came back, he marveled at how the two interacted, almost as though the dog was caring for the patient. The singular bond between humans and dogs that proved itself on the battlefield was an easy sell for the war-ravaged nation. Funding was found to support the training of hundreds of guide dogs. Various breeds were recruited, including Airedale Terriers, Giant Schnauzers, and Newfoundlands, but the majority were German Shepherd Dogs, a breed developed by a man we met in previous episodes, retired Prussian cavalry captain Max Emil Friedrich von Stefanitz. The German Shepherd... The German she- The German Shepherd dog fit the mold nicely. They're highly trainable with good temperament and good sensory skills. And happily for Max von Stefanitz, they happily happily ge- <clears throat> happily German Shepherd Dogs are also versatile. They were developed in the late 19th century as a shepherd dog at the edge of an industrial boom, when the demand for herding dogs was waning and demand for police and ambulance dogs was waxing. With Stalling acting as relentless advocate of training guide dogs for the blind, Von St- uh, that other guy, Uh, pushed every button to promote the German Shepherd as an ideal guide dog. Beyond their strong breed characteristics, they were framed as the canine embodiment of German virtues, loyalty, bravery, strength, and intelligence, and it didn't hurt that the German Shepherd's wolf-like appearance aligned nicely with popular national symbolism. In those early years, as the Weimar Republic languished, the German guide dog program expanded and flourished. In a six-year span in the 1920s, some 5,700 dogs were trained. The fundamentals of guide dog training in 1920s Germany drew on insights forged over centuries. The work you see a guide dog doing today is the culmination of months of complex training for both a canine and its human partner. Guide dogs are trained to follow a number of basic commands, such as forward, left, or right. But there's a lot more to their training. The dog must also control its natural urges, such as squirrel. I was going to say cats, other dogs, or discarded food. Guide dogs must provide unconditional obedience, but also to disobey commands that might expose their human partner to danger and it must make allowances for hazards and spaces that might pose a danger to a human. A low-hanging tree branch, a a pothole, or the gap between a train and a platform. Meanwhile, each partnership must be built on one vital intangible. The bond between the dog and their human. It's obvious when you see this training up close and personal that guide dogs need a distinct set of breed attributes, but Even with just the right breed and training and a strong bond, another obstacle remained. In many ways, it will be the toughest of all to overcome. You're listening to Down and Back, stories from the AKC archives.
Despite successes in training, many of Dr. Stallings' graduates found themselves struggling to scale the wall of public acceptance. However well-trained guide dogs were, they still looked the same as lesser-trained pets and were routinely denied access to restaurants, parks, and public transit. In hopes of moving the needle, campaigns were launched to help celebrate and normalize guide dog teams. They were commemorated in statues and on the otherwise almost worthless coins and banknotes of the time. As Germany's guide dog program found traction, demand grew sharply for new litters to train, and that led to a new problem. Disreputable breeders, anxious to cash in on the growing demand, bred too many dogs too quickly, flooding the market with dogs that weren't up to the job. And it wasn't just Germany. At almost exactly the same time as Dr. Stalling was getting started, a Viennese physician, Dr. Leopold Senefelder, proposed a guide dog program for Austro-Hungarian soldiers blinded in the war. Associations of dog breeders came on board and suggested Hungarian breeds for the task, including the Puli from the herding group. Why that breed in particular? Well, this feels like just the time for an AKC breed biography. The Puli is distinguished by its compact build and signature dreadlocks. Those cords of hair provide natural weatherproofing for this agile, faithful, energetic herding dog. The Pulik, fun fact, Pulik is the plural of Puli, were believed to have been brought to Europe about a thousand years ago by the Magyars, an Asian nomadic people. Beneath their corded coats are an undercoat of very dense, soft wool, the ideal uniform for guarding large flocks on the Hungarian plains. Remarkably light on their feet, Pulik have earned their reputation as the acrobats of the dog world. As a herding dog, the Puli's intelligence, adaptability, and problem-solving skills make it an obvious initial candidate for work as a guide dog. And like other herding dogs, a poor match for couch potato owners who don't want to give them a job. I hear you asking, but for all its virtues is the Puli guide dog material. Dr. Senefelder would never find out. Authorities poo-pooed the initiative, clinging to their belief that blind people should become self-reliant without any form of external support, including canines. As they put it, The most practical, most economical, and constantly available guide of the blind person is himself. Soon after this condescending dismissal of a guide dog program, the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed. Coincidence? You decide. They weren't alone. In Britain, where more than 20,000 soldiers were rendered blind during the war, officials who clearly hadn't read their Dickens initially rebuffed a plan to train guide dogs, though they later saw the light. Which brings us back to New York City in 1927. As guide dog programs in Europe slowly found momentum, they still weren't a thing in the U.S. It could be that, by comparison, poison gas produced relatively fewer American casualties. Those rendered blind were counted in the hundreds. Enter Dorothy Harrison Eustace, the Philadelphia-born animal lover, philanthropist, and for our purpose, author of that article in the Saturday Evening Post. Read all about it! Wait, turn away. I owe that guy a nickel. In 1921, Ms. Eustace moved to Switzerland, where she founded a kennel, Fortunate Fields, and raised German shepherds for work as police and guard dogs. A few years later, her travels brought her to the kennel in Potsdam that trained guide dogs for blind veterans. There, she was inspired. Parking herself on the business side of a Remington Model 2 portable, she typed like the wind. 4,000 words later, she had it. The opus grande of the American guide dog movement. This was her article in the Saturday Evening Post, titled The Seeing Eye. The dog must have perfect obedience, and yet he cannot be a machine. He must have certain initiative to take care of situations as they come up. 
He must obey all commands and yet be ready to take matters into his own realm if sudden violence threatens. The article, powered by the Post's circulation of more than two million, helped give the guide dog movement its first meaningful foothold in the U.S., but nothing would inspire people more than a flesh-and-blood guide dog team in action. Enter one Morris Frank of Nashville, Tennessee. Totally blind from the age of 16, he navigated daily life with a human attendant and a cane. When a newspaper vendor called his attention to the piece in the Post, Morris Frank was a man on a mission. He wrote Ms. Eustace and found the resources to travel to Switzerland and train with one of her dogs, though her German Shepherd dogs had never trained as guides before. There, he was introduced to Kiss, a dark gray German Shepherd with a creamy patch on her throat and soft brown eyes. For weeks, both Frank and Kiss were trained in core commands, forward, right, and left. She learned to halt before obstacles and curbs and to use her nose to indicate latches and elevator buttons. For obstacles Frank couldn't anticipate, she would take the initiative and lead him on an alternate route. Training complete, the two prepared to return home to a press blitz and show America what a guide dog could do. Just one more task remained. Kiss was rechristened Buddy. With two feet and four paws on Terra Americana, the two engaged in a dog and pony show, give or take the pony, with the boys of the press, camera bulbs flashing, snappy questions flying, and press cards tucked firmly in the brims of their fedoras. It was the golden age of the press stunt, and America's newest guide dog team had come to play. Soon off the boat in New York, Frank and Buddy were challenged to cross West Street along the Hudson River, in those days a hotbed of traffic chaos. Despite the noise and distractions, Buddy performed flawlessly. At a lecture in Washington, D.C., organizers told Frank that he and Buddy would be led up a center aisle to the stage. Later, Buddy would lead Frank back the same way. Ah, but the plot thickened. Once Frank and Buddy were on stage, organizers quietly placed obstacles across the center aisle, including a bar, high enough to obstruct the man, but not the dog. Buddy, of course, watched the whole thing. To the crowd's oohs and ahs, the German shepherd calmly called an audible and guided Frank out along an aisle on the side of the room. In a separate and unstaged incident, Frank was waiting at an elevator. When the door opened, Buddy not only refused to move but blocked his feet. A passerby screamed and warned Frank not to move. Buddy had prevented him from stepping into an empty elevator shaft. The press blitz was a huge success. Soon, guide dog training facilities began popping up in the U.S. For Morris, Frank, and Buddy, anything seemed possible. Unless they wanted to ride on a train, or dine in a restaurant, or even visit some people's homes. Public acceptance of guide dog teams may have been moving in the right direction, but it would take a change in the law to put a spring in its step. A change prompted by a curmudgeonous U.S. senator in a freak cigar lighting accident. Stepping outside a Fargo courthouse one noon hour, about a century ago, Lawyer Thomas D. Shawl stopped at a cigar stand for a smoke. He was handed a newfangled electric lighter, but instead of running on a six-volt battery, the cigar stand attendant had plugged it into a city lighting circuit. The lighter exploded in Shawl's face. In the days that followed, his eyesight faded, faded into blackness. Later elected to the U.S. Senate by the fine folks of Minnesota, Shaw became acquainted with Jack Sinekin, founder of LaSalle Kennels. In 1926, they imported and trained a German police dog, that's in air quotes, as a guide dog. It was the first of 3,000 dogs the kennel would train for such work. That dog, Lux of LaSalle, was presented to Senator Shaw. When the railroads refused to allow Lux to travel with him, the senator did what Morris Frank could not. He introduced a bill, damn it! 
allowing guide dogs for the blind to accompany them anywhere, including restaurants. This would form the basis of guide dog accessibility laws in place today. Behind every guide dog team is that inexplicable bond between canine and human, beautifully explored in the book Emma and I by British author Sheila Hocken. Ms. Hocken, who lost her sight as a teenager, wrote of her guide dog Emma, a black Labrador retriever who served her faithfully for 11 years. Then the story took a twist. Soon after surgery restored Ms. Hocken's sight, Emma experienced vision problems. Ironically, the breeds best suited to this work, Labradors, Golden Retrievers, German Shepherd Dogs, are among breeds susceptible to eye problems. So it was that during those last months of Emma's life, the two swapped roles. It was now Sheila Hawkins' privilege to guide her aging lab. There's something mesmerizing about watching a highly trained guide dog go about their job, embodying that perfect trifecta of careful breeding, meticulous training, and that near-mystical canine-human bond. Despite centuries of history, it took the enormity of a world war and a crusty U.S. senator to vault guide dogs into everyday American life. In time, it would inspire fantastic new roles for service dogs and guide dogs that would transform countless lives. Let's call that a story for another day. Down and Back, stories from the AKC Archives. Visit akc.org for more on all things dog and find bonus materials for this episode. Follow AKC on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook at American Kennel Club. On Twitter at AKC Dog Lovers. And let us know what you thought of the show. And let us know what you thought of the show. If you're new around here, subscribe with your favorite podcast provider to catch up on this season and past episodes. Founded in 1884, the American Kennel Club is the recognized and trusted expert in breeds, health, and training. We advocate for responsible dog ownership and are dedicated to advancing dog sports. Research for Down and Back is provided by the AKC Library and Archives, the only national repository dedicated to the sport and enjoyment of the purebred dog. Learn more about the collections at akc.org slash library. There's always a wise guy.